Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started here. This is uh, session 18, and the uh, title of this is, just as a reminder, we're going through the Indwelling Life class. This is, we actually are going to have 30 sessions. <laughs> Anything and everything you want to know about the Indwelling Life, I think it covers it. So we've been going through that most of about a year. This is session 18. I'm trying to finish up session 18 and session 19 to finish up the class before we go to Africa in a couple of weeks. So anyway, just want to uh, just want to just say that uh, this is going to be. I'm trying to get uh, this thing done uh, before we leave. So that's why I'm doing it. Um, I found out yesterday that, and she's not in here to say this, but my sister-in-law Heather listens to Audible books on three times speed. And I was like, okay, I didn't know what that meant, but she, they played it, and I was like, it was talking so fast, I couldn't understand a word I was saying. I feel like I'm going to be talking really fast to make sure I get everything done, but I'm going to, you know, hopefully slow the pace down. But anyway, this is, this is a very important message. It is the cross, about, it's about the work of the cross, it's about the way of the cross, it's about the cross of Jesus Christ being applied to us. And I, I don't believe that the cross message is very popular in the church today, but it's the foundation of true Christianity. It is Christianity 101. And so I just want us, us to start today here by uh, reading two scriptures as we get started. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And in this scripture, the Lord is, is really laying out to us the requirement if we want to follow him, if we want to follow him, the requirement. And Jesus said, we know it's, it's a very familiar scripture, but Jesus said, he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. Self-denial is not really a popular message in the Western church today. And that's why we don't hear self-denial messages, but it's vital. It's absolutely vital. It's, it's the Christianity 101, self-denial. You cannot follow Jesus if you are living for yourself. That's just really simple. Um, and Jesus said, and, and take up his cross daily. It's not just a one-time thing. It is a daily taking up of the cross and following me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake is the one who will save it. That word life is the word suke, which means soul. Jesus is telling us here, and I'm going to get into this more in the message, but Jesus is telling us here in this passage that the cross, self-denial, is there is an application to it to the soul, to the mind, to the will, and to the, emo the emotions. And in fact, the will is one of the most, the, one of the hardest things to break, and one of the hardest places where self-denial resists the most is in the will. But the cross applied to the will is the only way for the life of God in us to be released. This is where we're going with that. So just to, just to give you a con context, so Luke nine twenty three through twenty four is Jesus talking about the application of the cross to the soul. To the mind, the will, and the emotions. Now let's turn to Romans 8, 12 through 13, where Paul is writing to the Romans. And I was writing something in preparation for our trip to Africa that just leaped off the page. And I'd never really, it never really registered with me the way it did this past week. Is Paul is writing in Romans chapter 8, verse 12. He says, So then, brethren, He's talking to who? Brothers and sisters in Christ. He's talking to the church. We are under obligation. See, there's this idea floating around in the church that, you know, just believe in Jesus Christ and that's all there is. Now, I'm not going to get into that whole topic of, you know, conversation, but, you know, there's a big topic there. But I'm just going to say this. There is an obligation, Paul is telling us, by the Spirit, with an apostolic command. There is an obligation... For every single born-again Christian to, uh, to not live according to the flesh. It's not just like an option. It's not just like a good idea. It's not just like, okay, you're radical and it's okay. If you, know, you want to live by the Spirit, um, that's cool. But if you want to live by the flesh, that's okay. You know, the Lord loves you. That's not what Paul's saying here. 
There is an obligation. There is a requirement. There is a mandate. There is an expectation. There is an imperative from the Lord that you don't live according to the flesh. That you live according to the Spirit. And now Paul says, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die, or the actual translation is, you will die or you are about to die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so that's the application of the cross to the flesh. That's the application of the cross to the body of death. That's the application to the, of the cross to the sin that is indwelling in this body that is yet to be redeemed. Paul is saying you must put that sin to death in your body so that sin does not rule and reign in you. Amen. So... That's where we're going here in this message. And so if, you know, I'm not going to get into the fall of man and all that happened, but just to summarize it like this, when Satan tempted Adam in the garden and says, if you eat of this fruit, he said it in the King James Version, said it this way, you shall be as gods. You shall be as gods. Now the devil is a liar, but he was telling the truth about that. That fruit made them little gods. That fruit made us little gods. And the God we worship eating that fruit is self. Self-life, self-awareness, everything of the self-life came into the human soul when Adam and Eve ate that fruit. And it's the, that, that, the fall of man is when self-life was awakened. It's when self-life came alive and that has been the problem with the world ever since. Yet the, there is a solution for self-life. There's a solution for self-life in the soul that is awakened. See, remember way back when we talked about two life sources. As a born-again believer, you have two life sources within you. You have the life source of Jesus Christ because God's spirit dwells in your spirit. You are one spirit with him. Or you have self-life that you can still choose to live by if you're a Christian. And Paul, or not Paul, but the scriptures are saying that when Adam ate that fruit, self became exalted, self became inflated, the self-life of the soul became awakened to the point that self began to live. <clears throat> and sin began to be the effect of that. Now, the Lord has provided a way of escape from all those who are in Adam. And it's called the work of the cross. It's called the finished work of the cross, which we've been going through uh, a lot lately. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant his work as the atoning sacrifice for sin was completed. And all who put their faith in Jesus Christ, his righteousness is imputed to them or credited to their account his justification and his perfect obedience is imputed to your account so that therefore God the Father says on your account you have the, right, the absolute righteousness of Christ and you have his penal substitutionary death uh, crucified in your place has been credited to your account. Therefore, you're justified. Praise God. And we talked about, in the last two uh, sessions, we talked about not only were, are you justified, not only are you righteous, but when Christ died because you were baptized into his body, because you are one spirit with him, because you have union with Christ by faith, you were also identified in the death of Jesus Christ so that when he died, you are considered to have died with him. That's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6, that do you not know when you were baptized into the body of Jesus Christ, you are baptized into his death. You have union with the death of Jesus Christ. You have union with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ so that historically you are identified in his death. So in God's eyes, it's as if you have died in Christ when he died. That's your legal position. We talked about all about that in the last messages. If you didn't get that, you can go online and listen to it. So when, when Jesus was on the cross and he said, it is finished. All of the sins of the world were imputed to Jesus or reckoned, or reckoned to be imputed to him in God's eyes so that he became sin. All that was in, of Adam, all that was done throughout the world, both past, present, and future, all of those sins were imputed to Jesus Christ on the cross so that when he died as the atoning sacrifice, the sins of the world went into the grave with him. 
And all who put their faith in him can now have his righteousness. That means in Adam all are sinners, but in Christ all are righteous. In Adam all are condemned, but in Christ all are justified. In Adam all will die, but in Christ all will live. This is the work of the cross, and this is the work of the cross that delivers us from the effects of Adam's sin. And we've talked all about this, your legal position. You are, God considers you dead, crucified, resurrected, ascended, and enthroned, and victorious in Jesus Christ. That's your legal position. We talked two sessions about that last time we were together. Now we're talking, we said in the last session, your living condition, how much you experience of that, must be aligned to your legal position. And this is where we're getting into more of the experience of the cross. See, your inclusion into the historic death of Jesus Christ, if you don't apply that into your daily life, will have no effect in you. You've got to apply it. You've got to experience. You've got to experience the, work, the way of the cross working in your soul and working in your body so that God's life in you can be released. So there's the work of the cross I just talked about, and there's the way of the cross, or some have called it the cross life. It is what, see, the, the, the work of the cross is what Jesus finished for you on the cross. The way of the cross is what the Spirit is now finishing in you. See, the way of the cross is experiential. The work of the cross is legal. And so God wants to align that legal condition with your living condition so that you begin to experience this work of the cross so that God's cross is applied to your soul and to your body. That's like goes down, to quote Terry Bennett, like a rat sandwich in the, mess, the Western American church. But we've got to have both of those working of the cross. So talking about the application of the cross, Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. When Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ, he was talking about his historic identification or his identification with the historic death of Jesus Christ. Paul was basically saying, what I taught in Romans chapter, well, Romans 6 had not been written, but basically what Paul wrote in Romans 6, he was saying in Galatians 2.20, I died and I was crucified with Christ, yet Paul said, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. It was Paul's identification with the death of Jesus Christ, the historic death of Jesus Christ, that then did something in him experientially to where Paul said, I no longer live. See, what happened was the historical crucifixion with Christ was now being applied experientially within Paul, and Paul was no longer living by self-life. Now, if you read Paul closely, you see there was a journey. You see there was a journey from Galatians all the way to Philippians, where in Philippians he said that I would be conformed to the death of Christ so that I might also experience his resurrection. So he hadn't arrived when he wrote Galatians. But Paul was, was tapping into this life where I am no longer living, but Christ in me is living. And so... That is the application of the cross. That's the application of the cross. And so just to, make it, just to make it simple, the application of the cross comes in two ways. There is the application of the cross to your soul, to your mind, to your will, to your emotions, especially to your will, because our will wants what we want, when we want it, how we want it. And if we don't get what we want, how we want, how we want it, we get grumpy, irritable, Mad, rebellious, independent, because self has to die to follow the Lord. If you want to be a bride made ready for Jesus Christ at his second coming, the cross must work into your soul, into my soul, so that what we want is crucified with him so God has his way. That, I mean, that's just Christianity 101. It almost sounds like it's a false gospel in this Western church we live in, sadly, but that's basic 101 Christianity is when you came to Christ, you were surrendering yourself to his lordship to follow him. And the cross, the second application of the cross is the cross applied to your flesh, your body of sin. Paul said there is indwelling sin in your body. 
This indwelling sin will not be taken away until the resurrection of the dead, until you get a new body, until you get a resurrected, glorified body. There will be indwelling sin in your body. That indwelling sin will drive you and move you to do things that are contrary to God. So Paul, or the, the scriptures are teaching there are two applications of the cross. There is the application to your soul, and there's the application to your body. We need both. We need both applications. And so, you know, we've been going through 10 different laws of the Spirit, and we're on the ninth law of the Spirit. And here's the ninth law of the Spirit, is as you apply the cross to your soul, especially to your will, especially to your will, get that, the will dies slowly. The will has to be broken. As you apply, and when I say as you apply, by the Spirit, that's always implied, as you apply the cross to your soul, especially to your will, greater measures of the Spirit are released from within you. See, some people go, well, that sounds like bad news. You're talking about my soul being broken. You're talking about my soul being crucified. It's like, it's, it's not bad news when you've ever, when you experience the life of Jesus Christ. His life is far superior to your own boring self-life. And we're talking about the Son of God's life, the eternal Son of God's life, flowing through you, being released through you. It's far better than your boring, selfish, sinful life. So this is good news, not bad news. So though there's pain in the process, it's ultimately good news. So now let's talk about the cross applied to the soul. And we're talking about the release of the spirit. And I, I learned this from Watchman Nee in his book, The Release of the Spirit. It really, really was like eye-opening to me. But uh, John, or the Lord spoke in John 12, 24. He said that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. Now, the Lord was talking about his death on the cross but I believe his death on the cross was a pattern that all who follow him would also embrace their own cross. So I believe it was not just him saying he was doing this. He was saying those who would want to be like him also would pattern their lives in the same way. But he said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, I'm not a farmer, but just doing a little bit of research on the internet. That's a shock to you. I'm not a farmer. Yeah, that's, that's like, wow, he's not a farmer. Yeah, you should see our garden. Never, I'm, I'm not, we'll go there. <clears throat> we tried to grow a garden to survive the end times, and we got like three tomatoes out of it, so we're in trouble. <clears throat> yeah, I judged dad's crops, and now, anyway. I'm not a farmer, okay? I mean, I'm not a farmer, so just re doing a little research, there's a grain, a grain of wheat has a hard outer shell around it. Now, there's life within that seed. But the problem is that hard outer shell blocks the release of life. And if the life of that seed must come forth and bear fruit, then the hard outer shell must go into the ground and die and be broken so that the release of the spirit can come forth. See, if you're born again, you have a full salvation in your spirit. You are a partaker of the divine nature. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one. Your spirit literally touches God inwardly. You are always one with God if you're born of the spirit. His spirit is grafted to you. There is divine life in your spirit. But there is, like the grain of wheat, there is a hard outer shell called the soul, self getting what it wants, self pride, independence, rebellion, I want what I want, when I want it, that self-life, that self-life is a hindrance and an obstruction to the divine life, to the God's divine life in your spirit cannot be released until the hard outer shell of the soul is broken. We don't like brokenness. Raise your hand if you like brokenness. I hate brokenness. Now, when I talk about brokenness, brokenness doesn't mean God puts you into terrible situations. Brokenness is really about your will being broken. Now, if you're stubborn and refuse it, it might mean you go through difficulties and challenges and trials to break you. But if you'll be wise and not resist and say, God, break me easily, he will do it easily. He doesn't want to, like, break you in a hard way. He wants, it doesn't, however you get there is he's going to do it, but... 
Do it the easy way and say, Lord, break me. And again, you're not praying trials into your life, but you're saying, God, break my stubbornness and my pride and my rebellion and my independence so that my life will not hinder the release of your spirit. See, until that hard outer shell is broken, until that hard outer shell is uh, goes into the ground and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, then the life that's already inherent in that seed begins to be released. You already have life in you if you're born again. You are a partaker of the divine nature. But that hard outer shell must be broken for the life of God in you to be released. So the Lord continues in verse 25. He says, he says, this is really interesting, the connection here. He says, he who loves his life, that word life again is suke, soul. See, what would prevent brokenness is loving your life. I mean, who doesn't love their life? I and mean, we all are born loving our life. That's part of the fall. But, but the Lord is saying, he who loves his life, he who loves his self-life, his soul life, loses it. But he who hates his life in this world keeps it to life eternal. I believe the Lord is hitting on something of the work of the cross working to break open the soul, especially the will that is so stubborn and rebellious and proud. I say that from experience. My mom says, mom and dad say, amen. The soul is a blockage to the full release of the Holy Spirit from within you. See, remember what we've talked about in this, in this whole class. You have within inside of you, because Christ is in you, that means you have resurrection life. That means you have Shekinah glory. You have rivers of living water. You have creative power. You have the anointing. You have power for ability. You have the truth. You have the kingdom of God within you. All of that is true. All of that is Christ in you. You are a partaker of the divine nature. You have everything you need for life and godliness. Life is inside of you. You have his virtues, his nature, his love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit are already inside of you. You don't have to look up and pray to God, Lord, give me more love, give me more peace, give me more patience, give me more faith. Why? Because Christ is already in you. Don't look upward, look inward to where Christ is in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have that inside of you. It just needs to be released. See, there is, there is life in you waiting to grow to maturity. There is life in you waiting to conform you into the image of Christ. There is life in you waiting to make you ready as a bride prepared for Jesus Christ. But there is a hard outer shell called the soul that blocks the life from being released. There is hindrances to the release of the spirit. We talked about those hindrances in, all the way back in session four. The rational mind, uh, sin in the body. Um, we talked about emotions and experiences, all those different hindrances to the uh, release of the spirit of God. It takes the cross and the application of the cross by the spirit of God to put that, the, that self-life to death so the life of Jesus Christ can be released so that you organically can produce fruit. See, there's the, the, Jesus told the parable of the parable of the uh, abiding life, John 15, is his spirit is like sap. That, that, that sap flows through the vine into the branches and then organically fruit is produced. Some fruit, much fruit, fruit that remains but there is a hindrance to that fruit that's called self-life. And when the Father wants to prune you so that you can bear more fruit, he's going right at your self-life. Say amen. amen. You should know that if you're a Christian or been a Christian for a while. See, until the will is broken, the life that is in you is hindered. Now, you might have a little bit of life released. You might have a little bit of life flowing, but that, that, all, that, the, all that's inside of you, the life of God inside of you, is blocked and hindered by the stubbornness 
of my will and your will until the cross works to break it. Ouch. If you've been broken, it's painful. It's worth it, but it's painful. I would say if you're going through a breaking process where God's breaking your will, when you don't get what you want, when you want it, how you want it, don't quit. Okay? It's worth it. I'm not saying I'm completely broken of the, my will. I'm not. But God's done a work. God's done a work. Don't quit. Let him have his way to get whatever he wants so that the life of Jesus Christ that is within you can be fully released. You know, what the church needs more than anything is the fullness, the full release of the spirit that's already inside of the believers. If the church of Jesus Christ had more of Christ released and less of self, we would be a much different church. We would be much more emerging to that glorious church without spot, stain, or blemish. We need the work of the cross, no matter how painful. We need the pruning of God, no matter how painful. See, your soul is the gatekeeper of his life. And what I mean by that is this. Everything we've talked about in this class, renewing the mind, um, whether it's waiting on the Lord for strength, surrendering your heart to the Lord for full possession, spending time with him, all of that that we've talked about, every single thing we've talked about, all of that hinges on one thing, your will. Your will's the gatekeeper. Your will is like a dam. The soul's like a dam for the release of the Spirit. Your, your soul is like that, the door that opens to release the water that's behind it outward. Your soul is the gatekeeper that determines not only if it happens, but the measure to which it happens. So your will decides whether or not you renew your mind. Your will decides whether or not you wait on the Lord for strength. Your will determines how much you surrender of your heart to the Lord so he can possess and fill you. Your will decides whether or not to block out time to seek him. It's your will. That's where the cross is most painful because it's applied to what you want when you want it. And when you don't get it the way you want it, we, I get grumpy. Just, just ask me when I don't get my food when I want it the way I want it. Sorry. See, your will decides whether you live from your spirit, your soul, or your body. Your will determines whether you're carnal or spiritual. It's your will. It is your will. And so if we want the release of the Spirit of God, we've got to have the cross applied to our will. That's why, again, I want to read, I want to read now Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Through 37. We read Luke's version. We're going to read Mark's version. I just want to drive this into us. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. He must take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life or save his soul will lose it. And whoever loses his life or his soul for my sake and the gospels will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? See, again, the Lord is, is hitting on this necessity of the cross life. The cross and the will go together. The cross is applied to the will. Jesus, Jesus died in Gethsemane before he died on Calvary. When Jesus said, Father, may this cup pass before me, but not as I will, but as you will. When Jesus made that declaration in Gethsemane, he then could go to Calvary to finish it, but Jesus died in Gethsemane. I don't mean physically, but his will went to the cross at that moment. And his body followed that decision. When we talk about taking up your cross daily, it is a daily surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ. 
See, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? The Lord is not interested in a mental assent or a mental agreement that he's Lord. He's not interested with you just saying, Lord, Lord, but living for yourself. No, lordship requires absolute surrender to, his, to him. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do, do what I say? It takes the cross of Jesus Christ working in the will for that to happen. Let's turn now, let's see this in the scriptures. Hebrews chapter 10, verse, verse 7. I'm probably not going to get five-star ranking on YouTube for this message, but it's the truth. Not that I ever get any five-star rankings, I'm just saying. It's not a popular message in the church. Hebrews 10, 7, talking about the Lord, he says, Then then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above that sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law, then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. Listen to this. This is where I'm really hitting at. This is my main point here. Is by this will, by Jesus saying, I will be the body that's sacrificed, by Jesus dying in Gethsemane before he died on Calvary, by this surrendering of the Lord's will to the Father, you have been sanctified. Now, it started in the will, but it ended in the body. You have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. My point here is to drive home the fact from Scripture is that the cross must work in its way into the will. You know, again, the the self-life, I want what I want, when I want it, and the way I want it. And if I don't get what I want, the way I want it, then you get mad, grumpy, irritable, down, depressed, etc., That will must be crucified through the working of the cross so the spirit can be released. And that's where it's the struggle. That is the struggle. That's the daily struggle we have. It's that the cross must work in the will. Well, I don't feel like doing it. That's the emotions leading you. I don't think, you know, you rationalize it away. That's the mind leading you. And the will follows along and chooses what it wants. But God says you must die daily. You must experience not my will, but your will be done. You must say, I am going to embrace any discomfort, any death of self working so that the life of God can be released. Amen. That is the cross working in the soul. I I don't believe the bride can be made ready apart from this. If you want to be Revelation 19.7, the bride's made herself ready, this is imperative, the, the cross working in the soul. Now let's talk about the cross working in the flesh. Now, technically, you could say the flesh, and biblically speaking, the flesh sometimes was used to describe just the body of sin or sin in the body, the indwelling sin in the body. You could just talk about the body itself. Sometimes it was the coupling together of the soul and the body together. So, but, and what I'm talking about now is, you know, we, I'm, gonna t- I'm talking about primarily the, the actions of the body in coordination with the soul, that you have to put those deeds of the flesh to death by the Spirit of God. See, when Paul was writing Galatians, he said basically this, if your self is still living, if self-life in your soul is still living, there will be deeds of the flesh that will be organically produced when you live that way. Just like there are the fruits of the Spirit when you live by the Spirit, there are deeds of the flesh that are produced when, you, when self-life in the soul is living. He lists them in Galatians 5. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, 
outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I think about my life in high school, and for like three years, it was probably like, okay, check, 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 check. Okay, not sorcery, didn't do so, but check, check, check. You know, you know, living in the flesh. When you're living for self, you will produce naturally and organically these deeds of the flesh. That's why we must take up the cross. That's why we must have the Spirit apply the cross to us. You know, at the beginning of the message, I talked about Romans where Paul said, you're under obligation, you're under requirement. See, a lot of the church today doesn't like to talk about requirements because we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. That's true. That's absolutely true. But there are requirements, there are obligations for those who are born of the Spirit, and one of those obligations is not to live according to the flesh. It is not an option as a believer in Jesus Christ for you to live according to the flesh, to do what you want and what your body is craving to do to give into it. It's not an option to give it what it wants, whether it's lust, coveting, anger, rebellion, immorality, impurity, whatever it is. Paul says, no, you must, by the Spirit, put that to death. It's an obligation. It's a mandate for anyone who is in Christ to do those things. It's not an option. Obedience is not an option. I don't know where we got that idea. We didn't get it from Scripture that you can just put your faith in Jesus Christ and obedience doesn't matter. Absolutely not. Find the verse that shows me that. Still with me? <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad there are people out there that actually, isn't it weird that we, some of us actually like this message? I do. It's the truth. I just want to talk just a little bit about, we're talking about the sins of the flesh. We're talking about the deeds of the flesh. I just want to talk about sexual sin just for a second. And just to be honest with you, the whole Mike Bickle, IHOP, scandal, crisis, whatever you want to call it, if you don't know about it, you can search on about it. It's just made me very aware in the church, in the charismatic church, how little regard we have for sexual sin, how little, how indifferent or casual we treat sexual sin. And to be honest, I was convicted as a leader that I probably have not shared the seriousness of sexual sin like I should. And so I felt convicted that I needed to do that. You know, just thinking about Mike Bickle, Mike Bickle was called as a forerunner to make the bride of Christ ready, yet he fell into repeated sexual sin. We don't know all the details, but over a number of years, and just thinking he was called to make the bride ready, but if leaders are falling into this, how much more the rest of the body of Christ? And it was just making, it was convicting me that I needed to make sure I was clear of how serious sexual sin is because I believe we have really watered the, this down in the name of grace. Here's what we got to understand. I mean, you should read the Sermon on the Mount and take off your Western American Christian goggles, glasses off, and read Matthew 5, 27 through 30, where Jesus said, you have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery. He's quoting the law of Moses. But I say to you that if you look at a woman to lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Wow. Looking, okay, not even the physical act of adultery, I mean, not, he, that's very serious, but he's saying not as serious, but very serious as well, is even looking at a woman to lust. Now, we might just go, okay, well, I'm saved by grace through faith. <clears throat> His blood cover me. Now, listen to what he says after that. He said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Now listen, the Lord said, it is better for you to enter life maimed without having an eye or a hand than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Do you understand 
He's not just saying something to fill up his time. This is very, very serious. To engage in sexual sin. And I'm going to say, Scripture is very clear. Sexual sin is only permissible within the context of marriage between one man and one woman for life. That means anything, whether it's pornography, adultery, immorality, homosexuality, impurity, anything like that is forbidden by Scripture. And Jesus is telling, now listen to this. Jesus is not just saying, bringing up hell just because he has nothing to talk about. He's saying that can potentially put your eternal, sal eternal salvation in jeopardy. How serious. To engage in sexual sin out of the context of, uh, to engage in sexual sin is to put your eternal salvation in jeopardy. It's playing with fire. Okay? That's straight from Jesus. That's straight from the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, that's like, that is serious, weighty stuff. Now, I just want to just balance this out a little bit. I believe your salvation is secure if you're in Jesus Christ in, up to this point. I believe that it's, it is, I believe your salvation is, is secure. It's possible you can fall away though it's very unlikely. I consider it like this. It's like a plane. There's like a one in a 11 million chance of a plane dying or plane crashing. But just imagine that there's a 0% chance that your plane could crash and you're flying from Boston to London. And if you're in that plane, you're going to absolutely make it to, to London, no matter what, unless you do something stupid. <laughs> unless you open the exit door you could, you know, unless you open the exit door or you hijack the plane and you try to fly the plane yourself, you're going to arrive safely in London every single time. But if you get stupid, if you do stupid things, if you start playing with sin, if you start playing with sin like fire, you can potentially put your salvation in jeopardy. <clears throat> it's, it's a, we should have the fear of the Lord about this. And not treat this kind of sin so casually. We, that's why the Lord was saying, you've got to take radical. That's why he's saying, you must take radical steps. Radical steps in your fight against lust. Pluck your eye out. Now, he, okay, he does not mean that literally. Of course, we know that. He does not mean literally cut off your hand. I mean, when I was in high school, I thought he meant it literally, so I cut my thumb off. Just kidding. He doesn't mean it literally. I don't want our whole church to be like, can't see, can't, you know, use our hands. He's not saying that literally. He's saying, fight the fight of lust by doing whatever it takes in your power not to allow lust to have preeminence or dominance over you. So I just want to say whether you're listening online, whether you're attending our church, if, if you're engaged in any kind of sexual sin, whether it's, whether it's immorality, adultery, pornography, homosexuality, whatever it would be, to, to repent in the fear of the Lord and turn back to the Lord, to put your body of sin to death. Amen. It's an intense message, but it's the truth. It is the truth. Here's the thing, in your fight against sin, most people struggle in their fight against sin because they believe the lie their flesh is too powerful. Do you not realize who lives inside of you? Jesus Christ lives inside of you. Your flesh is not too powerful. In fact, if you look at I want you to read, turn to Romans chapter 6, 6. See, whatever your battle with the flesh is, whether it's lust, whether it's jealousy, whether it's anger, whether it's drunkenness, coveting, judgmentalism, whatever it is, we think that the flesh is too powerful to overcome. We believe that lie, and because we believe that lie, we don't live in victory. But here's what Paul says in Romans 6.6. 6. Knowing this, that your old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Now, 
In the Greek, when Paul says that your body of sin might be done away with, that Greek word, I'm just going to make it really simple. The best, word, the best translation of that is the body of sin was rendered powerless. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, your body of sin was rendered powerless. The power in your body to sin with the connection to your soul, with the connection to a dead spirit, has now been rendered powerless because why? The Spirit of the Lord is now connected to your human spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is now grafted to your human spirit. The, the very life that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is infusing and empowering and anointing and in giving you life in your spirit. Therefore, you have power inside of you to put this flesh to death. Your flesh is not too powerful. It's a lie. It is a lie. You have the power of God to put your flesh to death. It reminds me of the, the Wizard of Oz when, you know, if you've seen that, I, you know what, I'm like one of the one people, my age, one person, I'm, I'm the only one that I know of my age that never watched the Wizard of Oz, but I just kind of saw clips and stuff. I just got bored watching it. But anyway, if you've seen the Wizard of Oz, there's that one scene where, you know, the, the wizard is, you know, scaring Dorothy and the cowardly lion and the tin man and the scarecrow. And, you know, she's, that, that wizard is like taunting them and, you know, projecting fear and they're enchanted. And you can just see them, they're, they're trembling in fear of this wizard. And all of a sudden the dog Toto goes behind the curtain and sees this old man and he's this old man screaming into a microphone and pulling the levers and, you know, moving the lights and everything. And all of a sudden they've opened the curtain and they're like, this is all it was. The man behind the curtain is all this was. And that's the way I think about your flesh. Your flesh is, is been put, has been made powerless. And so the lies of the devil and the lies of your flesh that say you cannot get victory over this sin, you cannot get victory over this sin, those, that's just the man, the old man behind the microphone yelling into it, it's powerless to defeat you. Now, if you do stupid things, it will defeat you. But you have a greater power, the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you to put the flesh to death. Your flesh is not more powerful than the indwelling Holy Spirit. And, if you, and that's why John said in 1 John is that the one born of God does not practice sin. The one who's born of God does not sin. It doesn't mean he never sins. It means he never practices sin. The one born of the Spirit does not practice sin. The one who has been regenerated with life inside of them, the one who has God's seed in them, the seed of the overcomer, Jesus Christ, who has divine life inside of them, the one who's born of God does not practice sin because sin has been rendered powerless by the cross of Jesus Christ, by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And so as we bring this to a message to a close, God is calling us to the exchanged life where we no longer live, but Christ in us lives. Oh, it's a beautiful exchange. You're exchanging your pride for his humility. You're exchanging your anxiety for his peace. You're exchanging your gloom and depression for his joy. You're exchanging your selfishness for his love. You're exchanging your unbelief for his faith. You're exchanging his... Your rudeness, well, my rudeness, I'm not sure if you're, you're probably nicer than me. My rudeness, especially when I talk to telemarketers and salespeople. Your rudeness for his kindness. Your lack of control for his self-control. The exchange life. Christ becomes in you love. Christ becomes in you peace. Christ becomes in you joy. Christ becomes in you meekness. Christ becomes in you faith and faithfulness. Christ becomes in you kindness. Christ becomes in you self-control and goodness. The exchange life where you lay your life down in exchange for his life flowing through you. The cross of Jesus Christ applied to self-life in your soul the hard outer shell of self-life in the soul, broken so the release of life comes forth that we might be filled with the life of Jesus Christ. That is what the world needs. 
We must have a church that lives by his life, not by their own. Amen. Before we close, just want to say one thing. You never trust a preacher who says we're almost done because they're lying. <clears throat> okay, so we're, you know, we're going on our trip to Africa here in a couple weeks, and we're going to be gone for about two weeks. And we, 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 needed to, we need to raise about $5,000 more. And I just want to encourage you. Just let me say, I'm not, I wasn't preaching that message like take up your cross, deny the Lord, as a manipulative way to, for you to give. I was not doing that. Okay, so I, want you, I don't want you to think that. Oh, he's manipulating me, so I should take up my cross, so I'll give more. I'm not at all doing that. Um, but we need to raise about $5,000 more to m- meet our budget for everything we need to do for this trip. We're bringing 35 leaders over from seven or so different countries. I mean, it's, it gets expensive. We're feeding them. We're putting them up. Of course, us getting there and everything. So we need about $5,000 more. And I just want to encourage you. I, I'm, I'm convinced we can raise the money we need. Just want to encourage you um, just to ask the Lord how much he would have you to give and then just be obedient. And, you know, remember the whole will part. If you're will, no, I'm not going to do that. Just ask the Lord how much he would have you to give and just be obedient. And so if you want to give, you can make a check out to Life School or you can also give online at give.lifeschoolinternational.org give.lifeschoolinternational.org, one word, Life School International, one word, give.lifeschoolinternational.org. The link should be in the YouTube description if you need a link to click. But just want to encourage you to give as the Lord leads, just so we can meet the budget we need for this trip. So amen. Thank you so much uh, for listening. God bless you, and just hope you have an awesome week. Amen. Um,